speaking to TRT World. Let's get straight to it. How concerned are you with the deteriorating situation in Afghanistan? Well, let me just say that uh, what at one point we expected a bloodbath, because if you see what happened after the Soviets left, in 1989, there was a bloodbath in Afghanistan. Hundreds and thousands of Afghans died after that. And that's how Taliban emerged. Uh, this time, you know, we, we again, we were scared that there would be, in taking of Kabul, there would be a bloodbath. But so in that way, it has been an incredibly peaceful transfer of power. Very unexpected. However, now the problem is, uh, this looming humanitarian crisis because a government, an Afghan government that depended uh, for 70 or 75 percent of its budget on foreign aid, the moment the foreign aid component goes, and that's what people feared that with, a, with the Taliban coming in, there would be no foreign aid. So unless there is help in the short term, I mean in the long term, maybe the Taliban would be able to uh, stand on their feet, but in the short term, unless they are provided aid, there is a grave danger of a collapse of a government, uh, chaos, and a humanitarian crisis. A lot of this depends on the international recognition of the Taliban government in Afghanistan. Is Pakistan going to recognize the Taliban government? And if so, when? Well, you know, we, uh, our government decided that we would be consulting all the neighbors of Afghanistan. We will uh, discuss with them about uh, the timing of when to recognize the Taliban regime. So we are in discussion. Um, and so we, you know, Pakistan alone recognize the Taliban is not going to make much difference. It has to be uh, preferably, uh, you know, the United States and Europe and uh, China and uh, Russia. But if all the neighbors get together who are, who are who are going to be the most affected if there is uh, chaos in Afghanistan. If we all get together and sort of uh, form a joint policy, uh, when to recognize them, I think it would have more impact than simply Pakistan recognizing them. But it's a difficult position for Pakistan because unless and until there is recognition of the Taliban government, <clears throat> humanitarian aid supplies, the, all the reserves that are frozen abroad for uh, the Afghan government, they can't necessarily be released. The big question is, when is the United States going to recognize them? Do you expect the United States to recognize the Taliban government? Um, sooner or later, we'll, they'll have to. At the moment, as you can see in the Senate hearing, uh, in their media, there is a shock, confusion in the US. Uh, they are completely surprised by this outcome of after 20 years, Taliban coming back again. And there is at the moment finding scapegoats. I feel very unfairly targeting President Biden. I think it's unfair because what could he do? Whenever a date of exit was given, whenever, if two weeks before that exit date, the Afghan army collapsed and the president fled the country, the same thing would have happened. So, you know, he was taken by complete surprise, and as was everyone else. But I think he's been un very unfairly being targeted. And also they're trying to find scapegoats, one of them being Pakistan. And therefore, they're not in a rational mindset, the way forward. But, but clearly, if, if the US does not defreeze their uh, reserves, uh, and the Afghan government collapses, and this goes into a into a chaotic situation, the biggest loser will be the people of Afghanistan. And uh, you know, uh, the UN estimates that by next year, over 95% of the people will go below the poverty line. So therefore they have to uh, come up with a solution. I mean, they have to sooner or later uh, think about the people of Afghanistan. Uh, and. And unless that happens, I'm afraid uh, this limbo is every day we are losing. Uh, uh, the, Afghan, uh, the, uh, the Afghan population is, uh, 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 the crisis is going to deepen. 
you were talking about finding scapegoats. There have been uh, hearings held at the U.S. Congress where U.S. censors and lawmakers have been questioning the military high command as well as uh, people from the Biden administration. And time and again, they single out Pakistan. They're calling for sanctioning Pakistan and say that Pakistan is complicit in the Taliban coming to power. You see, uh, people like us who know the history of Afghanistan and Afghanistan's history is very closely uh, tied up to history of Pakistan or what was then India. But this, the border adjoining uh, the border with Afghanistan um, is, you know, if you know the history of that, of the Pashtun people, because they're uh, uh, half the pop all, roughly half the population of Afghanistan is Pashtun. Uh, double that the number of Pashtuns live in Pakistan. And along the Afghan border, both sides are Pashtun tribes. So if you know the history, anyone who know, knew the history knew this would happen. So people like me who, you know, who know the history, and I, I did a travel book also of this, of our side of the uh, Pashtun areas, Pashtun tribes, um, we knew this would happen. We knew that eventually there would not be a military solution because uh, the people do not accept foreigners. They, they have resisted foreign, foreigners, especially if, if they are not Muslims. And um, the Pashtun tribes might fight each other, but when, when a foreigner comes, they get together. And then the second uh, uh, characteristic of, of a Pashtun is that they seek revenge. If there's someone is killed in their house, they will, go, they will seek revenge. And to seek revenge, they will join the militants. So on this side of the border, exactly the same thing happened when we uh, decided to uh, become an ally of the US. Uh, because the uh, Taliban were Pashtun, sympathies for Taliban, not because of the religious ideology, but because of the Pashtun nationalism. On our side of the border, we, we had for the first time the Pakistani Taliban. And they called us collaborators and started attacking us, which is the TTP, the Pakistani Taliban. Exactly the same thing happened on the other side. The more collateral damage, the more drone attacks or aerial, aerial bombing, the more night raids where uh, people were humiliated or killed, the more the, uh, the militant ranks swelled. So the Taliban movement grew over a period of time. And uh, this, so we, by, by 2008, I went to the US. I addressed the think tanks. I met Joe Biden as a senator. I met um, John Kerry as a senator. And I explained to them. But then I realized that they were clueless. The American public had no idea what was going on in Afghanistan. Hence, they are completely taken by surprise. They thought they had built a democratic government, that there was some they had um, liberated their women. You know, people in the US thought like that, and there were so few American casualties. So Afghanistan was, you know, s something which was not in their minds. So when this suddenly happened, they had been all taken by surprise. And therefore, you see this in, in Senate, the sort of questions being asked. They, are so, uh, they had no idea that this was happening. But believe me, in Pakistan, people who knew Afghanistan's history, army chief in 2010, General Kiani, went to meet uh, President Obama. He explained to them that there will not be a military solution, that the moment you lead, the Afghan army will collapse. He told them that, look, you will leave a mess there, and we will, we in Pakistan, will suffer the consequences. But he, again, they had no idea. Some people say that this position of yours now, looking back in retrospect, is quite prescient. But they also accuse you because of the stand of being, they call you Taliban Khan. You see, it was this awful, arrogant, imperialistic attitude of uh, the Americans under George Bush when he said, either you're with us or against us. You know, after 9-11, this amazingly ridiculous statement if you do not support our policies, you're against us. So therefore, if I did not uh, agree with this military solution in Afghanistan, then I was pro-Taliban. 
and that's why they're all in a state of are you pro taliban i i'm anti military solutions i do not believe that the way to solve world's problems are using military means i was against the iraq war i i if there's an objective analysis done about what has happened in iraq i even objected to my own uh, country uh, using military means for instance in east pakistan when we used uh, military uh, you know to resolve the issue i am i i do not believe in military solutions but in this case i knew the subject much better than anyone in the us understood so therefore uh, it was this amazing thing that you know if you criticize the us policies you were anti american and you were pro taliban and you didn't have to spend 2 and a half trillion dollars to get to that conclusion uh, uh, and you know uh, even i, I objected to pakistan uh, becoming a, uh, involved in this war we had nothing to do with 911 no pakistani was involved al qaeda was in afghanistan um, we had no militant taliban even uh, in pakistan so what what had pakistan to do with this war where a country loses 80000 people our whole tribal belt was devastated 3 and 1/2 billion people internally displaced we were called the most dangerous place in the world our economy went down 150 billion dollars lost to the economy uh, our, our our currency lost half its value in 2008 so i mean we paid a heavy price for this but for what and in the end rather than being appreciated for for making these sacrifices just because we became an ally of the us to be scapegoated for this blunder in afghanistan I think that has been the most painful thing for us. Are you afraid now that because of the scapegoating and because of this revenge or animosity within the US towards Pakistan that we or the Pakistanis will suffer more uh, adverse consequences? I think um, whenever this anger goes and some rationality uh, 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 appears in the US they start rational thinking about this. They will realize that how could pakistan be responsible for this simply because how could 300000 well equipped afghan army give up without a fight and afghans are one of the bravest nations in the world why did they not fight it wasn't because of pakistan how could they give up to 60 to 70000 lightly armed militia if pakistan was helping them they wouldn't be they appeared in kabul on motorcycles without shoes compare them to the afghan army so if you do an analysis of why that happened why did they not fight the conclusion will be anything but pakistan was responsible the conclusion will be number one afghans have always resisted foreign occupation they are a very independent party people they are basically a free nation free thinking people the culture is very democratic so they do not accept foreign domination number one number two the way i repeat the night raids the bombing from the air you do not fight guerrilla warfare by bombing villages so the collateral damage then uh, uh, there was hatred against the americans and that hatred translate translated into more militancy more people joining and taliban became a popular movement in the rural areas so th- that was the reason why in the end they didn't win it was it because of pakistan now the taliban is in power and pakistan has is left behind once again to deal with the fallout of a hasty us withdrawal recently you wrote in a washington post opinion piece that the international community will want to see the inclusion of major ethnic groups in the afghan government but i spoke to senior taliban leaders in kabul and they say that there is no way that they will allow the inclusion of people like hamid karzai even abdullah abdullah people that were part of the previous dis- dispensation during which the taliban lost a lot of their own people families and so on and so forth so where's the disconnect there what does pakistan do if the taliban refuses an inclusive government as uh, the the as pakistan and the international community has been pushing look from from pakistan's point of view when we say an inclusive government 
we recognize, and everyone recognizes, uh, uh, even the Taliban would recognize, that Afghanistan is, is a multi-ethnic group. Pashtun are around about 50% of the population. Then there's a big Tajik minority. Then there are Uzbeks. Then there are Hazaras uh, and other smaller uh, minorities. So an inclusive government means a stable Afghanistan. So people who are interested in the welfare of the people of Afghanistan, who've been through 40 years of conflict, so anyone who feels, uh, wishes them well, would want a stable Afghanistan, and a stable Afghanistan means an inclusive Afghanistan. Yeah, but the Taliban then turn around and say that you are interfering, Imran Khan is interfering in the internal affairs of Afghanistan by pushing for an inclusive government. Uh, so, so uh, let me clarify. Number one, as a well-wisher of Afghanistan, we would want them to be stable and have an inclusive government. Now, what sort of inclusive government should not be dictated to the Taliban government? Because that is interference. If you say, pick so-and-so and so-and-so and take names that you must include them, that is interfering in their internal affairs. And I would imagine that they would uh, resist that. Uh, because remember, Afghans are independent-minded people. There's no one. The, the idea that anyone can control them from outside, whether it is the US or it is Pakistan, it is a fantasy. It, it cannot happen because that's their history. So we, we can just, as well-wishers, suggest that they should be inclusive government, which they too agree. What should not happen is they should be dictated that look includes A, B, and C, and that would be interference. It's a fractured society, Afghanistan. It's a fractured polity, especially with various different groups of the Taliban now inside the country, in Kabul, in power. They can't even communicate with themselves. Do you think they'll be effectively be able to communicate what they want, where they stand, and where they want to take Afghanistan to the international community? Look, I think... Uh... And also uh, tying in with Pakistan, because Pakistan, or the international perception is that Pakistan controls the levers of the Taliban. They control the Taliban. Look, again, people don't understand the Afghan character. You cannot control people of Afghanistan. And history as a guide, I mean, look, look at the history of Afghanistan and say, look at the history of the whole of India. India, kept, you had one battle, you know, and whoever won the battle controlled India. Afghanistan was never like that. As I repeat, it is a decentralized democratic system. They are very democratic people. It's not a feudal system as it was in India, which is why it was easier to control India. And the, because the tribes, the uh, uh, Pashtun tribes, which are half, uh, half of Afghanistan, and twice as many Pashtuns on this side, they resisted the British exactly for 80 years. The, uh, the British controlled the whole of India, but the the Pashtun areas, the tribal areas, there was resistance throughout the 80 years of, of British interaction with them. So therefore, Afghanistan cannot be controlled from outside. It is a very difficult situation which they are in. Anyone who takes power after 20 years of, of fighting, civil war, people think they have given a lot of sacrifices. So now to, to come into power and then... Um, even dealing with your own people, forget about it, including other people who were not part of the struggle. Even dealing with your own people, I would imagine, is a pretty difficult situation right now for Afghanistan, for, for the Taliban government. So therefore, if you're asking me what will happen, I don't know what will happen. I pray that's all we can do. We pray that after 40 years, the people of Afghanistan would have peace and stability. But I don't know what will happen. How would you define the U.S.-Pakistan relationship as of now? Uh, I think, you know, well, we're, we're talking uh, with the U.S. We're constantly in touch with them. Our security, our head of intelligence is dealing with them. Um, our foreign minister is dealing with their foreign secretary. But, but the president right. hasn't called you up. No, he hasn't, but it doesn't have to be like that, you know. I mean... Uh, the, why is that? The, the, 
the president or the heads of state, I mean, they talk, when they talk to each other, basically it's a formality because all the homework is done by uh, people below. So it's not necessary. Uh, it's not necessary for the, for the most powerful man in the world to call the Prime Minister of Pakistan, who is at this moment one of the most critical people as far as Afghanistan is concerned? I, you see, I, I repeat again, I think uh, right now, President Biden is under a lot of pressure because you he know- He almost seems sympathetic. Sympathetic. Uh, sympathetic. Sympathetic because, you know, he has been criticized for the, for the awful airport scenes. But, you know, my contention is, how could he predict that the two weeks before the exit, the president would, uh, would flee the country and the Afghan army would collapse? How could, we couldn't predict it. Taliban couldn't predict it, so how could he predict it? So therefore, he's, so the, those awful airport scenes, they have caused such a sort of uh, 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 incredible reaction in the American public. And of course, then the Taliban taken, taking over. So therefore, he's under severe criticism right now, which I have sympathy because, you know, we know we sort of, in our position, you know when, when you are under a lot of public pressure and media pressure, so I guess, you know, it's up to him. I mean, when he wants, he can talk. So there's a way forward still for U.S.-Pakistan ties, despite what has happened or this animosity. Of course, of, of course I mean, you know, uh, the U.S.-Pakistan ties have been, you know, over uh, 50, 60 years uh, since Pakistan became part of CETO and CENTO. And then in the Cold War, we were the, with the U.S. Uh, ties go up and down, you know, you have your highs and lows. But uh, I think in, on Afghanistan, it is critical that U.S. now plays a part. Because, you know, look, they were there for 20 years. And if there is a mess, they, they wash their hands of Afghanistan, it, it will become a repeat of 1979 when the Soviets, when they left and the U.S. left. And look what happened to Afghanistan after that. The bloodbath that that took place, over 200,000 Afghans died in that, and there was total chaos in Afghanistan. So the last thing for anyone, most of all us, we, were, we neighbors will be affected, others uh, around uh, Afghanistan, all the other neighbors will also be affected. But then US, what will it have to show in the end? That after 20 years spending over $2 trillion, uh, hundreds and thousands of Afghans died in this time. What will they have to show if, the, if there's chaos there again? And then in chaos is what, where the uh, international terrorists found a safe haven. In the past month, actually in about 40 days, uh, since the Taliban uh, walked into Kabul, there have been 24 attacks on Pakistani security personnel inside Pakistan, in the border areas and settled areas. Over around 100 Pakistani security personnel have been killed in these attacks, which have been claimed by the tehreek e taliban Pakistan, or TTP. Is Pakistan facing uh, another or renewed attacks by the TTP because of the emergence of the Afghan Taliban in control now in Afghanistan? Uh, what happened was that in Pakistan in 2014, uh, the, uh, our security forces did a big operation, and this was in North Waziristan. And the TTP, the Pakistani Taliban, who were uh, 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 doing terrorist attacks within our country, uh, they were pushed out. And they then went into Afghanistan. And I'm afraid not only were they helped by the, uh, uh, the Afghan intelligence agencies, but they were also helped by, the, by RAW, the Indian intelligence agency. And they then used them to uh, conduct attacks within Pakistan. But these attacks dropped significantly over the past few years. Uh, yes, they did drop, but they attacked through uh, TTP. They attacked the Chinese uh, nationals who were working in Pakistan. And they also conducted a series of attacks uh, in, in Balochistan. So uh, since uh, in the last 40 days, there has been an increase. Uh, and, and we fear that... Are you concerned about that? Uh, up to a point, not that much, because we are, we have very disciplined uh, 
security forces who are very experienced now. Over 15 years, Pakistan got uh, uh, more experience than probably any other country in dealing with counterterrorism. And we have, as, a, as the world knows, one of the best intelligence agencies in the world. So we, we are confident that we'll de deal with it. Problem right now is that with people, we, we had about 250,000 uh, people come into Pakistan from Afghanistan. And amongst them, we fear that they have, uh, uh, they have been uh, t members of TTP who were in prison in Afghanistan who were released. Even ISIS, we feel that they have, uh, amongst these 250,000, few have come inside. So, you know, that's where the problem was because of uh, the sudden takeover of Taliban and the uh, influx of people either going out of Pakistan, using Pakistan to, to go uh, on other destinations, uh, or simply uh, people who have come in. So, you know, that is a concern temporarily, but I think we will be able to deal with it. You don't think the Taliban taking over in Afghanistan will become like a beacon a rallying cry for all these groups, especially TTP, which is ideologically aligned with the Afghan Taliban, not so much with ISIS Khorasan. Uh, you see, the difference is that uh, there's a Muslim government in Pakistan. So what are the Taliban waging a war against? You know, in Afghanistan, they declared jihad because they said it's a foreign government and it's collaborators. In Pakistan, they, they initially the TTP came in saying we were collaborators of the Americans, and same the old mujahideen who were who, who were trained to fight the Soviets. They too also termed our government as collaborators and were attacking us, which is why we lost eighty thousand people. Uh, but and then there were drone attacks in Pakistan, and you you stood up against those drone attacks. You in fact held rallies to stop the NATO supply line going from Pakistan into Afghanistan. You, of all people, should know more about this. So is there like an innate concern then that this could go out of control, Prime no, Minister? No. Let, let, let me just clear, uh, clarify. Drone attacks, to f use drone attacks to kill, to fight terrorism is the most insane way of doing it. Because no matter what anyone says, Whenever a bomb explodes in a village, there is collateral damage. And, you, and as we saw in, a, uh, in Kabul, the drone uh, doesn't always get the right people. So it was the worst way because what happened was that the drone attacks might have got some militants, but the collateral damage they caused created anti-Americanism and the, the revenge attacks were against the Pakistan uh, state of Pakistan. So, uh, so, number one, it increased the militants. The number of militants grew because anyone who had, who, in a village when the bomb exploded, when, when they lost people, their relatives, they then joined the militants. So the ranks of the militants spread. And it was completely counterproductive. And we bore the brunt, Pakistan bore the brunt of the fallout of the drone attacks in Pakistan. So therefore, you know, uh, 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 now, there are no drone attacks because at that time they called us collaborators. Now, it's not the same case. And therefore, the motivation, uh, why would they attack the state of Pakistan? Whereas then they, had, they could give some You're justification. Not concerned. You're not concerned? No, I, I don't think so. That the, uh, the su success of the Afghan Taliban movement in taking over Afghanistan, defeating the greatest military in the world, the Americans, will not have a spillover effect or will not inspire similar like-minded groups in Pakistan? Uh, I think, uh, you know, it's a, a completely different. What was happening in Afghanistan and in Pakistan now is completely different. In fact, I think some of the, uh, the Pakistani Taliban groups actually want to talk to, the, uh, to our government, uh, you know, for some uh, peace, for, for some reconciliation. And we are in talks with some of the groups. What we hope is that this the TTP, will, are you in talks with the TTP? With some of them, yes. You see, so, it's, it's, there are different groups which, uh, which form the TTP. Yes, so we are in talks with some of them. Uh, on surrendering or reaching yes, on, on, you know, a reconciliation process. Is the Afghan Taliban helping you in this process? Uh, in the sense that it, they are, 
the, the talks are taking place in Afghanistan, in, in that sense, yes. So there is, a, there is some sort of negotiation or talks underway between Pakistan and the Tariq Taliban Pakistan or some groups of the TTP to lay down their arms. Yes, and, and, then, and then we forgive them and they become uh, normal citizens. This is quite a, quite a revelation, uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan. So you are expecting some sort of agreement or some sort of deal to come out or emerge between the TTP and the government yes, of Pakistan? Yes, uh, I, I repeat, I do not believe in military solutions. I'm, I'm anti-military solutions. <laughs> So I always believe that, you know, as a politician, political dialogue is the way ahead, which I always believed was the case in, the, in, in Afghanistan. So why is the TGP the attacking Pakistani security forces if they're talking to you and trying to reach a negotiated settlement? I think uh, that was just uh, uh, a spate of attacks, but we are talking. We might not, uh, we might not re uh, reach some sort of a conclusion in the end, a settlement, but we are talking. We are also talking to the Baloch militants. We're trying to also talk to them and have some sort of a, a political reconciliation with them, uh, those who are willing to reconcile. You mentioned India and the role of India uh, that Pakistan says was uh, instrumental in carrying out attacks in uh, Pakistan. Um, there's been a lot of disinformation emanating from um, Twitter accounts control or social media accounts um, controlled by the, by, or being operated from India. In, uh, recently at the UN General Assembly, you said that uh, there is a war against Muslims in India, including in Indian administered Kashmir. If this is the case, can, what can Pakistan do to raise this issue, to contain this war against Muslims in India, as you say it? Look, um, what, what do human, right, uh, human rights groups do? They raise the issue at all levels and build pressure finally to um, fight these human rights which are being abused, not just for Muslims in India, but specifically what is happen, happening in the Indian occupied Kashmir. So we, are, we raise it at every forum, United Nations, uh, you know, in the human rights forum, uh, in the international media, because um, uh, you know, when people talk about uh, maybe the human rights abuses of Taliban, I think it should be, it should not be selective. They should also talk about what is happening in Kashmir, where about 900,000 Indian troops have basically put uh, 8 million Kashmiris in an open prison. So therefore, I feel that it should be even-handed. Uh, when human rights are selectively uh, uh, talked about, they lose the credibility. Uh, I, I, I feel very strongly that the world, the international community, should, uh, and the countries, uh, the powerful states, should talk about what is happening to the people of Kashmir. And that's it, lip service on talking about people of Kashmir? That's how pressure is mounted, you know, in East Timor, uh, there was... But now the, the Indians are part of the Quad. They, they were hosted by, Narendra Modi was hosted by Joe Biden and they're forming an anti-China bloc. And India is one of the critical components of that. So, so my two observations. One that, uh, you know, when, you, when, when people who you are allied with, you ignore the human rights abuses, and you only worry about uh, the countries who you're opposed to, and you mention their human rights abuses, you lose your credibility in that. Secondly, uh, my observation is that in trying to form these blocks, uh, the last thing the world wants is another Cold War. Because we saw the Cold War between the Soviets and the US, and the world sort of being divided into uh, two camps. I wish this does not happen again. Because um, by, by cooperation and by uh, the world coming together, there is much more to gain than by the world being divided. You, you mentioned, mentioned uh, India, we mentioned China, I mentioned the Quad. CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, is a critical part, uh, not just for your government, but uh, the government before this as well, um, to bring Pakistan or get Pakistan into an economic development mode. There has been some, for example, um, 
contacts between Pakistan and China. Over the past 20 months, since you last spoke to President Xi Jinping, that was in February 2020, have you had conversations with high-level Chinese since, including the president? I, I have spoken to the premier, uh, Premier Li, uh, almost, I think, three times since then. Uh, the thing is, uh, President Xi right now has not, uh, since the, the outbreak of COVID-19, he's restricted his movements. Otherwise, he was due to come to Pakistan. So he hasn't been anywhere out of China right now. And uh, I think we are soon about to have a meeting. Uh, I'm supposed to have a meeting with President Xi uh, in, in coming days. Our relationship with China is strong. It always has been very strong. Uh, Pakistan-China relationship goes back 70 years. And um, through all our ups and downs, basically this uh, relationship has withstood the test of time. So you're positive that uh, despite the slow progress, maybe, of some CPEC projects, it's all good as far as Pakistan China. Yes, uh, we just had the JCC meeting recently, and, uh, you know, it's heading in the right direction. Uh, unfortunately, COVID has, be, has caused huge disruptions in the world. And in this, in, especially in our communication, uh, the, uh, I was supposed to go to China, President Xi was supposed to come here, but all that got uh, restricted because of uh, COVID-19. Finally, you're talking about major disruptions in the world. The dollar hit 172 to the rupee, or rupee hit 172 to the dollar. Uh, the price of oil per liter in Pakistan is now at 127. Your government just increased those rates. Is Pakistan facing an economic crisis? It's not Pakistan. COVID-19 has disrupted supplies all over the world. Commodity prices, prices all over the world have gone up. In fact, Pakistan is still cheaper than other countries. But is Pakistan hurting as a result of it? Like most developing countries, in fact, developed countries do. In fact, look what, what's happening to India. India, there's massive increase in poverty because of COVID-19. So Pakistan also has been affected by the rise of commodity prices. So uh, this, uh, the rise of prices, inflation in Pakistan is basically imported inflation. Pri uh, oil prices have almost gone 80% in the past five months. So Pakistan imports oil, then uh, unfortunately we had to import wheat, and wheat prices have gone up, all commodity prices have gone up. Palm oil, which is 70% uh, of our, uh, we consume in Pakistan, is imported. And so that is almost, that doubled too. So we imported this inflation into Pakistan, which obviously causes people problems. But this is temporary. We feel that with the resumption of uh, the supply lines, uh, things will settle down in a few months. But the opposition disagrees. It says that your government is incapable of coming out with a uh, proper fiscal policy because you've changed uh, finance ministers or people in charge of the finance ministry <laughs> multiple times. What else would the opposition say? They are such a motley lot. They are fighting for their survival. They are deeply divided. They are facing massive corruption charges. In fact, this country would have been in a different uh, phase of our, of our evolution had it not been for the 30 years of plunder by these two families. They're, they're not political parties, they're family limited companies. They're just two families which, uh, which plundered this country. And so they're in disarray right now. And therefore they pick on anything. They don't realize that this country coped with the COVID crisis better than almost any country in the world. We were in the top four or five countries which not only saved our people from COVID, but we also saved up uh, people from the economic disaster which when you shut down your economy, you create massive poverty. We are one of the few countries which navigated between the two. And mashallah, thanks to the Almighty, very successfully. So now they have to pick on things. I mean, that's the role of opposition. But I would imagine they're pretty desperate right now. Prime Minister Imran Khan, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.